I'm Kenji Fujita from the Bank of Japan, and uh, um, this session uh, we will discuss uh, FX markets. Well, pretty much broad uh, topic, but uh, you know, uh, since this is a, a conference on money markets, uh, we're not going to discuss the exchange rate nor carry trade, but uh, we're going to discuss funding markets for foreign currency. I mean, uh, FX swap markets. And in this uh, FX swap market, there has been a well-known phenomenon uh, called a cross-currency basis, or you may call it uh, uh, deviation from the CIP, the uh, covered interest rate parities. I mean, uh, um, when you um, the, the borrow uh, dollars as uh, the foreign currency, uh, the foreign currency as a collateral, then you may uh, cost a little bit, you know, higher than other uh, secured funding market for dollars, and this uh, deviation itself uh, could be uh, fluctuating. And this uh, phenomenon, the, the cross-currency basis, actually uh, was uh, first identified uh, back in late uh, 1990s, actually in Japan, uh, in dollar-yen swap market when the uh, Japanese financial, uh, financial sector was in trouble. Uh, so perhaps uh, somewhat you know, uh, appropriate for me to chair this session, but, uh, you know, uh, but uh, uh, this uh, seemingly uh, local peculiar phenomenon was elevated uh, to the uh, center stage of the global financial system uh, in the period at around the GFC, the, the great financial system. And since then, uh, a lot of research works uh, have been done uh, to decipher uh, this phenomenon. But uh, the, the two papers uh, we will discuss today uh, would shed really new light uh, on this issue by first uh, meticulously handling uh, the granular data and with a very rich uh, policy uh, implications. So uh, the, the first paper uh, studies the implications uh, of cross-currency basis uh, for international capital flows by uh, using uh, the novel data uh, covering euro area derivative and security holdings. And the first paper will be uh, uh, presented by uh, Jan David Stigo uh, from the ECB. And uh, uh, the, the second paper uh, studies uh, the mechanism jointly uh, explains two important quarter and patterns uh, observed in the FX swap markets. The first, the increase in dollar demand by euro area banks, and second, uh, the spikes uh, in a cross currency basis. And the second paper will be uh, presented by uh, Professor Ronaldo from the University of Basel. And for each session, uh, we have a distinguished uh, discussant, uh, the Amy Van Huber from the Wharton School for the first paper, and uh, Anusha Chari uh, from the UNC Chapel Hill uh, for the second paper. So, uh, the, the Jen David, uh, you have uh, 30 minutes and the floor is yours. <coughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, present our paper um, today. Uh, this is a uh, joint work with uh, Christian Kubica at the ECB and Quentin van der Weyer at Chicago Booth. All right. So the motivation uh, for this paper starts with a key arbitrage pricing condition in international finance. This is the covered interest rate parity. Um, this relationship tells you from the perspective of a U.S. investor, for example, investing in U.S. dollar, in the risk-free rate, should give you exactly the same thing than investing abroad, let's say in the euro area, while hedging the risk of the euro. Now, since we are at the ECB, you can, you know, rearrange the term of this equation, and it will tell you that for a euro area agent, um, investing at home in euro or investing in the US while hedging the currency risk of the US dollar should be the same on a risk-free basis. Now we know that uh, this relationship has been violated since the, the global financial crisis, the great financial crisis. It no longer holds and these violation deviations are often referred to as the cross-currency basis. Um, by now, in the literature, we have a good understanding why that is the case. And one main explanation in literature that you can find is that, well, the new banking uh, regulations that were introduced after the crisis for major swap dealers made it harder for these dealers to supply the swaps. Hence, the cross-currency basis uh, widening. Now, what we don't know so much about what is not in literature 
are the implications of the cross-currency ba uh, basis. And what's the concern? Well, the main concern is following. We know that in period of turmoil, there's a widening of this uh, basis. And the main concern is that this widening somehow amplifies the turmoil through investment. And this concern is so much present that you know the Fed in period of turmoil has opened up um, dollar swap lines with some selected central banks. So what do we do in this paper? We ask, how do foreign investors who invest in US dollar respond to widening of the cross-currency basis? So this paper has two parts. One part, the first part is a model, the second part is the empirical evidence. I will have time uh, to describe only the second part today, but let me uh, give you a few words on the first part. So this is a stylus model of portfolio allocation and currency risk hedging. You're going to have three agents, and the most important one would be a euro area investor that finds it optimal to partly hold USD assets and to partly hedge the associated currency risk. And what the model is going to deliver is that shocks to the FX swap market is going to widen the cross-currency basis thus increasing uh, the cost of hedging the currency risk of the US dollar. And this is going to bring down the demand for USD assets, the demand for hedging the holding of those assets, and increase the demand for euro-denominated assets. Right. So the second part is the empirical evidence. Um, we have two sets of results. In the first set, um, we find that a widening of the cross-currency basis does exactly that. It brings down the, the demand, it reduces the demand for holding uh, USD-denominated bonds uh, by euro area investors. Now in these ki kind of exercises, um, you know, identification is key. So we use three layers of identification. The first one, a granular fixed effect. They'd be doing a good job at removing any uh, macro confounders. Um, but we wanted to go further. The second layer of identification is we exploit a nice feature of the market. Um, it turns out that those FX swap contracts are rather uh, short dated, two to three months. So if you hold a bond, let's say uh, seven, eight years uh, um, maturity bond, and you want to keep a constant hedging strategy, you're going to have to roll over a lot. And what we're going to have is every day, you're going to have some unlucky investors right before they need it to roll over their swap, the cross-currency basis widened. This group of investors is going to be the most exposed to the shock compared to other investors that, for example, need to uh, roll over in one month. And by comparing, the two demands, the impact on the two demands, we're going to uh, be able to, um, uh, to remove most of the, the concern, econometric concern. Third layer of identification, we'll, uh, we'll use a granular instrumental variable approach. Uh, I'll be happy to uh, tell you more about it. And then in the second set of results, we find that, well, um, this decreased demand for USD bond is going to have a a pricing uh, impact, mostly on the bond held by these unlucky investors. Um, and it, most of the action is going to be in the uh, USD corporate bond market. Right. So a word on the contribution, I won't be able to uh, uh, do justice to all these great papers. So what I'm just going to say is that we contribute to three streams of the literature. One on CIP deviation, uh, one on global capital allocation, and one on currency risk hedging. And our main contribution is to show a causal impact of CIP deviation on global capital allocation through a currency hedging mechanism. Good. Let me spend some time on the data because the data is one of the reasons why we're able to answer um, our research question. 
So we're going to use uh, two, uh, two main databases. One would be the universe of USD Euro FX derivative positions for virtually all agents in the Euro area. That comes from EMEA, the European Market Infrastructure Regulation. Uh, that's at, it is at the contract level, at a daily frequency. And as is the case for most of the data, we're going to uh, analyze, um, you know, uh, keep the, the, the data, uh, or, or time series would be between 2019 and 2024, early 2024. Um, Second database we're going to use is the universe of securities holding for each sectors in the euro area. Um, that's coming from the ECB securities holding statistics. Um, our sample will be corporate bond and government bond holdings. And it's going to be at the country sector. Think, for example, the German insurance uh, sector. And at the ISIN security uh, level and that's going to be quarterly frequency. And then uh, we complement the data with a, a few other sources. A word on the definition. Um, so the cross-currency basis, in the literature, it's, uh, it's um, quite traditional to uh, place ourselves from the perspective of a US investor. So that's how our cross-currency basis is determined. Of course, our paper is very much focused on the euro area investor. It turns out it doesn't really ma uh, matter which perspective you take, only the sign of the cross-currency basis is going to matter. So the cross-currency basis is going to be an actual dollar rate, the rate of return that our US investor can get at home on a risk-free basis, minus what this investor can get in the EU area while hedging the risk of the euro. From the perspective of the euro area investor, what matters is the following. When the cross-currency basis is negative, and the more negative it is, the more costly it is to hedge the risk of the US dollar. And here you have a time series uh, of uh, the three months cross-currency basis, and what you can observe is that most of the days, this cross-currency basis is negative. Okay? So it's going to be costly to hedge the risk of the US dollar. And this cost is going to be uh, time varying as well. Let me start with some new facts about um, currency investment and hedging in the EU area. So there are uh, roughly 2 trillion euro worth of USD denominated bond holding in the euro area. Okay? And it costs roughly 5 billion euro annually to hedge some of the, the associated uh, currency risk with those holdings. That's what the cross currency basis costs annually. Now, why the average maturity? Uh, of USD bond is quite uh, uh, typical. Let's say here it's nine years. That of FX derivative is solely two to three months. Okay, and as I said, we're going to exploit this. Need to roll over. In terms of pure size, uh, the USD Euro FX derivative uh, market is roughly as large as the U uh, European repo. So that's large. Um, and in terms of actors, um, you can look at the, the, the chart below. So which uh, chart uh, plots the net FX position by sector. The more positive uh, this position, the more you're going to be a demander of this hedge. The more negative, the more you're going to be on the supply side. And I want you to focus on the blue one, the one that dominates. Uh, all the others in the uh, positive territory. So you're going to have the investment funds, okay. partly due to their sheer size okay, in the area. So those are going to be the main demander. And the main supplier are, are going to be banks. And this is going to include some foreign banks in our data. That's the green line in the negative uh, territory. Good. 
Um, now the empirical uh, strategy. The goal is to show a causal impact, okay? a causal relationship between the cross-currency basis and investment decision. Right? To uh, illustrate the challenge, uh, it would be akin to regressing a quantity, okay? investment, on a price, the cross-currency basis. Or at least a, very, a price that is very related to what determines uh, this quantity. And you will have you know, uh, some reverse causality, omitted uh, variable bias, uh, you name it. Um, so our approach is threefold. We're going to have three layers of identification. The first one, the granular fixed effect. Um, they're going to be at the sector country level. And they'll be able to really remove a lot of the macro confounders, the one that the variables that would, that would uh, make the cross-currency basis move and the investment decision move without a causal uh, impact between the two, that would be removed uh, by, the, by the granular uh, fixed effect. But arguably, that would not be uh, enough. Think of. Uh, an increase in um, uh, U.S. interest rates relatively to, uh, to the euro. So it's a shock that is currency specific. Um, that shock is going to make, uh, um, arguably, investors invest more in U.S. dollar. But part of it would be hedged. But there won't be really a causal impact between the cross-currency basis and the investment decisions. So what we do is um, we exploit, as I said, the nice feature of this, uh, of this market, the fact that you know, if you want to keep a constant hedging strategy, you need to roll over a lot. Okay. And uh, as I said, every day you're going to have some unlucky investors um, that right before rolling over, you know, there's a widening of the cross-currency basis that happens. Those are going to be much more exposed than the other investors, taking the difference uh, in, in those two demands uh, will you know, remove uh, much of the concern. And then we go for a granular, a granular instrumental variable um, that will have the additional advantage uh, to give us some uh, quantification of the elasticities. So that would be a lot, uh, GABE and cohesion. So the idea is that um, Every day, we're going to, for each agent in the economy, we're going to take innovations in the uh, uh, FX um, derivative positions, and we're going to residualize them with our uh, sector country time fixed effect. We will take the residual, and that would be arguably some idiosyncratic shocks. And from these idiosyncratic shocks, we're going to construct our instrument. Our instrument will be uh, simply the difference between the size-weighted average of the shock minus the simple average weighted of the shock. So how can it be that we can construct a relevant instrument by doing something like that? Well, it turns out that when the market is very concentrated, those shocks, those idiosyncratic shocks, are not going to wash out in the aggregate and you would still have a relevant instrument. You'll see the first stage uh, in the, the next slide. Um, and if you believe that we did a good job in the, uh, in the first step, in the residualization, the exclusion restriction will also be respected because those are idiosyncratic shocks. Right. So let me start um, with our first results. This is not our main results, but it leads to um, the next slide is the effect of the cross-currency basis on hedging demand. The first column is simply our first stage. And it tells you that, yes, the instrument is relevant. You have a, a F uh, statistics that is uh, satisfying. The second, third, and, four of, uh, and fourth column are really um, studying the impact of the cross-currency basis on the net FX positions. The second column will be an OLS strategy with the granular fixed effect. Uh, the third one is the IV strategy. And the fourth one is IV combined 
with or comparison of the two groups of in, uh, investors. In those uh, three columns, we find a significant and positive uh, coefficient. What does it mean? It means when the cross currency basis widen, meaning becomes more negative, there's a decrease in those uh, hedging uh, contracts. Um, look at the, um, the coefficient of second, uh, uh, second column. It's much more muted uh, than the rest. So it means that if you stop at OLS, you know, the OLS strategy is preventing uh, the econometrician uh, to find uh, something probably with some uh, reverse causality going on. In terms of size, it means that um, idio um, an increase in idiosyncratic FX demand of one over the coefficient of the first column, roughly 8%, is going to depress the cross-currency basis by one basis point and then decrease the holding of FX hedging contract by roughly 2%. That's based on the uh, third uh, Now, on main results, this is the effect of the cross-currency basis on uh, US dollar bond holdings. Before looking at the table, um, uh, may I have your intention, uh, attention on the, on the equation we're trying to, to, to estimate? On the left-hand side, you have uh, the change in holding in the bond that we consider. And on the right-hand side, our main uh, our coefficient of, of interest is the alpha. This is the one corresponding to interaction between two variables, the change in the cross-currency basis, and a dummy variable that is equal to one if the bond we're considering is USD-denominated and zero if it's Euro-denominated. Okay? add or granular fixed effect. What does this specification do? It's going to compare bonds issued within the same industry, held by the same investor, but with different currency. Said differently, it's going to study the impact on the, uh, of a widening of the cross-currency basis on the demand for USD bond over and above the impact on euro bonds for the same, virtually the same bonds. So now to the table. The table has, has two parts, uh, denoted by those um, um, two uh, orange rectangles. The first rectangle um, is correspond to um, OLS or IV specification, but without or uh, role of a, a strategy. And the second uh, rectangle is with the strategy. In all the specification, you see that the cross-currency uh, basis are, has a significant impact on holding of USD bond. The coefficient is positive. What does it mean? It means that a widening of the cross-currency basis, when the cross-currency basis becomes more negative, you're going to hold fewer USD bonds meaning more euro-denominated bond. Note that the second rectangle go one step further and is going to compare the demand of this very much exposed investor compared to the other investors. So it's going to look at the impact on the of a widening of the cross-currency basis on the holding of USD over and above the, the holding of euro and how that differs for, uh, for the much more exposed group of investors compared to the other investors. And um, we still find a significant uh, effect. In terms of quantities, we find uh, that a decrease of one basis point in the cross-currency basis led to a decrease in USD bond demand uh, by up to 0.30%. Uh, so how large is, is this? So this is inelastic. All right, but if you find of uh, if you take off uh, um, fifth percentile shock, which is around um, 15 to 20 uh, basis point in terms of cross currency basis, 
it means a change of 4% of USD holdings. And given the size of the market, we are roughly at $100 billion uh, uh, US dollar bond that are being sold or not renewed. Now a word on the, uh, on the price impact. I've shown you that a widening of the cross-currency basis decreased the, um, um, the, the demand uh, for uh, USD uh, bonds and increased the demand for uh, Euros, uh, Euro bonds. Okay. And especially for the first group of investors. So if we can identify the bonds that are mostly held by these investors, we should find some pricing uh, effects. So what we did is we looked for this bond okay, held by the unlucky investors. We selected them. And we ran a regression to see if there's some uh, pricing in impact. We did find some pricing impact. The first column is the impact on uh, USD corporate uh, bond yield. What does it tell you? The coefficient is negative. It tells you that a widening of the cross-currency basis, so cross-currency basis more negative, is going to increase the yield of uh, USD uh, corporate bond. Now, of course, our regression, the mirror of our, of our result is that there is an increase in demand for euro. So where, what do investors, you know, how do they switch from USD to euro? bond, they, they go from USD corporate bond to uh, euro government bond. We find an impact on the yield. The coefficient is positive, meaning a widening of the cross-currency uh, basis is going to decrease the yield of uh, euro government bonds. We don't find an, inf uh, an impact on um, USD government bond just because our investors you know, represent a tiny a uh, fraction of that uh, market. Um, let, me, let me conclude. So our paper um, shows that frictions uh, in the FX uh, derivative market has a causal impact on international capital flows and asset prices. And if I may add a potential financial stability uh, implication, that's not necessarily an implication we currently uh, you know, put forward in the paper, but given the audience, um, it seems appropriate um, to mention it. So we know from the literature that after the, uh, the great financial crisis, there was an increase in banking regulation, right? The banking regulation became, became more stringent including in the uh, uh, U.S., the supplementary leverage ratio. And that broke the CIP. Now, this has, exp this has had two impacts on the cross-currency basis. First, it increased, on average, the cost of hedging, the currency risk of the U.S. dollar. But it has also uh, exposed these hedging costs to supply and demand shocks. So more volatility in the hedging. And our paper shows uh, that the cost of hedging, the currency risk of the US dollar, has a direct impact on non-bank investment choices. And one thing that I didn't have time to, to mention is that our sectors, our non-bank sectors, what they did is Yes, they reduced their holding of USD bonds, but they reduced their holding of hedging contracts even more. It means that after an increase of the cross-currency basis, they take on more currency risk. So one implication that we may formulate is that the banking regulation may have unintended consequences <laughs> on the risk-taking invest and investment behavior on uh, non-banks. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the fascinating presentation. And now, please, Amy, you have 10 minutes. Great. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to share my thoughts on this excellent paper. 
The covered interest rate parity, or CIP, has not held since the great financial crisis. The violation of this textbook no arbitrage condition is evidence <coughs> that financial intermediaries are constrained. This is important. As my co-authors and I show, the risk of this constraint tightening is in fact priced in the cross-section of assets. In other words, CIP deviations affect the unconditional expected returns of assets. What do the authors today show? They show that CIP deviations are important not only because CIP deviations affect unconditional returns, but that CIP deviations also affect the conditional portfolio choice of investors. And the authors show this by studying not just one, but two security level confidential data sets, which is truly a feat. Using the data set on EMIR FX derivatives trading, the authors show that when CIP deviations widen, the hedging cost increases. Investors in response to this optimally choose to have less of a hedged USD exposure. Then, using the data set on SHS securities holdings, the authors show that in fact, some of the investors achieve the lower hedged USD exposure by reducing how much dollar bonds they hold, and that portfolio re rebalance has price impact on dollar bonds. In many ways, I would argue that this first result on CIP deviations effect on investors' optimal hedged dollar exposure is more fundamental. Because without affecting the optimal portfolio choice, there would be no portfolio rebalance, and there would be no price impact. So allow me to focus on this first result in my discussion today. In particular, I'm going to walk you through an alternative model with the goal of underscoring why I think the results that the authors find are so important. And hopefully along the way, I can suggest a few possible directions for future research. Now, Jean-David didn't really have time to walk you through their model, but their model is really the state of art. It's dynamic, it's general equilibrium, and it has a closed form solution. In order to achieve all of this, the authors only had to make a few assumptions. For example, the two risky assets in the model, FX holding, as well as the risky uh, dollar holding, they're actually uncorrelated, as both the diffusion and the drift in their respective Brownian motions are uncorrelated. Moreover, there's actually no euro or domestic risky asset in the model, and UIP, or uncovered interest rate parity, is assumed to hold. Now, all of these assumptions are very reasonable to make the model tractable. At the same time, we might think that in reality, some of these missing ingredients are key to why investors hedge. For example, hedging might be the very tool that investors use to, tr to try to modulate the correlation between the FX return that the investors might have and the return on the risky asset, either domestically or abroad, i.e. the dollar. Moreover, by hedging, what the investors for sure give up is the possible expected return that they can earn from currency. Now, this wouldn't be a big deal if UIP held. But the one thing that we know is that UIP has systematically been violated and persistently as well. Now, I should say, it's probably te technologically impossible to embed all of these ingredients in the current model. And so that's why I'm going to walk you through a really simple static alternative model to try to capture some of these elements. So I'm going to consider a model with n foreign countries, each with its own currency and risky asset. I'm going to use omega to denote the portfolio weight in each of the risky assets, and psi to denote the portfolio weight of unhedged currency exposure. Now, psi doesn't have to equal omega. The difference will be hedging. If we conditional on omega, and there's reason to do that because we know there are frictions like home bias and other things that affect investors' portfolio choice. 
if we conditional on omega and let the mean variance investor to solve for the optimal psi, this is what we get. We get a term on the right which captures the covariance between return from FX exposure as well as return from the risky assets in the portfolio. We also get a term on the left, which is the various adjusted FX return. Now, this makes clear why I think the author's results are so cool. Because traditionally, a lot of the literature has focused on this beta, this covariance term, as the sole driver of FX hedging. But as the, as the authors show, this FX return, which really has two components, this C, which is uh, expected FX return from possible UIP violation, and this X, which is a uh, hedging cost from CIP deviation. These also matter. So over and above what the authors have already shown us, I'm gonna provide some cross-country perspectives. So this is from the data uh, that uh, Winshin Du and I constructed for uh, investors' portfolios in 12 different currency areas. What I'm plotting here is the investor exposure to FX on the y-axis and the variance adjusted uh, portfolio covariance on the x-axis, namely beta. So again, this is what the literature has traditionally been focusing on, and we do indeed see a positive correlation. Yet, the correlation is far from perfect, suggesting that there are other factors or uh, forces at play. In fact, if we look at the residual, that is to say the FX exposure unexplained by the covariance term, we see that they strongly correlate with UIP, DV, uh, UIP violation as proxy by interest rate differential, as well as CIP deviation, which is really to emphasize what the authors have shown. And this is why the results are so important. CIP deviations matter for portfolio choice over and above what you would think as considerations from portfolio variance covariance. The other benefit of potentially having this very simple model is that it demonstrates if we think that FX cost matters for investors' uh, portfolio decision, there are actually a few different components in this, in this FX return. Namely, there's a CIP deviation, there's UIP violation, and there's the variance of that FX return. So here what I'm reporting are the post-GFC averages of these returns. So two things stand out. The first one is that UIP violation, proxied by interest rate differential, it's really quite sizable. It's about two percentage points on average versus 20 basis points compared to CIP deviation. So that begs a natural question for future research, which is how do we think about the relative importance of UIP uh, violation versus CIP deviation in driving investors' portfolio choice? The other thing that you probably noticed is that the variance of this FX return is huge. So if I were to take a derivative of the first order condition from my mean variance investor, I would get that the optimal exposure to FX, would, uh, the sensitivity of this exposure with respect to CIP deviation is something far smaller than one. Now the one word that you might have caught in Jean-David's uh, presentation is that investors' response seems to be inelastic. But does this show that perhaps investors' response is still more elastic than what's optimal implied by the, uh, by the model? Well, actually not quite, because I cheated a little bit. The model that I showed you only allowed the investor to adjust the psi margin, that is the exposure margin. Now, if you were to allow the investor to adjust both psi and omega, the optimal elasticity would be larger. It would be a complex function of variance and covariance, but the bottom line is it's definitively not one. So that begs another question, and it's a really a broader question than just this paper, which is why do we always benchmark our estimated elasticity to one? Well, I sort of know the answer, because in our uh, traditional textbooks, we're told that Elasticity of less than one means that that elasticity is inelastic. And that cutoff makes a lot of sense 
in many of the industrial organization applications where we think that price would affect the agent's utility one to one. However, in asset pricing, we emphasize risk return trade-off. And so if two securities differ in their riskiness, shouldn't the same $1 increase in price, in fact, result in different responses in quantity? And if yes, how can we account for risks in our elasticity estimation? I'll quickly propose two very complementary approaches. First, we can try to just characterize risk directly at the security level. Now, this is going to be conceptually very challenging because the risk of a security is going to be the variance of its own return plus the covariance of its return with everything else. But our models can really help us in isolating which are the covariance terms that we want to focus on. So it's not without hope. Alternatively, though, I think there perhaps is a simpler way, which, which is that we can characterize risk at the orthogonal factor level. Namely, that behind every observed security level trading, there is an implied factor level trading. And risk factors are beautiful because they can be by construction orthogonal to each other so that their risks are totally captured by just their variance and no covariance. And so if you're interested in a new working paper of mine, we adopt exactly this approach to derive not just the, the own elasticity of currencies, but also cross elasticity among a panel of currencies. And so let me conclude. This is an excellent paper that provides valuable micro level evidence that FX returns matter for investors portfolio allocation. And again, the results are important because FX returns matter over and above considerations of return covariance. Thanks to the author's excellent work, now we can stand on the shoulders of giants and think of potential research questions for the future. Namely, that we can think about how different determinants of FX returns compare to each other in terms of their importance in driving investors' portfolio allocation. Moreover, we can think relative to the risk-adjusted optimal response to CIP deviation, how does the estimated elasticity compare? I think this is an exciting agenda, and I very much look forward to work being done in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can take a few questions from here? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Amy. And uh, now let's let open the discussion to the floor. And Take a couple of questions, <coughs> please. <coughs> yes. So, uh, Loriana Pelizzon, thank you very much for the presentation and also the very nice discussion. I have just a curiosity. You know, clearly you focus on bonds, but uh, you know, how, I would like to understand how much you can extend some of your results also to the equity part. So, are mutual funds doing the same thing for the equity side? Is this having a similar potential similar impact? And you know the usual question. And then uh, you know regarding the CC, uh, clearly the cross currency basis. Well, we know that is largely related, you know, to the fact that the, the inter, you know, the intermediaries have problem because also before the let's say the bank capital requirements, we have that after the crisis open up a lot. And we and I have a paper also with Davide Tomio that shows that. Uh, exactly that uh, let's, that indicators is having a significant impact also on uh, on the asset pricing of uh, the sovereign bonds in Europe. So on top of the liquidity, so uh, it's not just uh, the the recent let's say capital requirement. As soon as you have uh, friction, this this is not working anymore. Thank you very much. Are there any other question on that? Please here. <coughs> I have a very small question, Marie Horova, ICB. Um, just to get a sense of aggregates, do you know what share of the aggregate amount outstanding of your corporate bonds are held in the euro area and then for you as sovereign bonds? Thanks. Okay. Let me take one more from the, the lady over there. <coughs> 
Thank you. This is Fia Salim from Bank of America. Great paper, really interesting insights there. Uh, I was a bit curious um, to the implication for euro corporate bonds as well, because I see that you found a significant impact in euro government bonds, but is it really that investors are actually shifting directly to government bonds, or is it harder to see the impact on uh, corporate prices there? Thank you. So, yeah, okay, the last one, yeah. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm Joanna from Bank of, uh, Bank of England. And you look at the demand side of the uh, asset. What about the supply side of the asset? For example, you, you mentioned that the um, currency hedging is usually shorter than the asset, uh, life of asset. What about the investors who perfectly hedge um, their currency and then they see the opportunity, they can tear their uh, hedge and then, and then sell their assets? So are it th uh, those size, are they smaller than these guys? So I want to see the price impact because everyone wants to sell, in, in your paper, everyone wants to, uh, wants to sell their asset. Oh, yeah, everyone wants to sell their assets. So, uh, the, uh, sorry, sorry, everyone wants to ah, sell their assets. So, I, want, I, I wanted to ask about what about the, um, what about the um, people who perfectly hedge it and then they want to sell it because there is a CCS uh, opportunity cost that is higher. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, Jan David, would you Yeah, respond? I start with the discussion. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I really like your version of uh, uh, the model. Uh, let's see if we can do a dynamic uh, version of it uh, with cloud forms <laughs> solution. Uh, yeah. I see Quentin, <laughs> that would be your task. <laughs> um, uh, thank you very much also for, um, for this graph. Um, I find it very uh, interesting, the point of, on, on UIP. Um, the difference in magnitude is well taken. Um, from a financial stability point of view, I think it's, it's still very uh, relevant to understand uh, the extent in which those non-banks retain the risk, the currency risk of their investment or not. And that's only something you can do with uh, FX swap and uh, looking at the CIP. But uh, um, yeah, you gave me some ideas for future research. Thank, uh, thanks a lot. Um, the other question, um, I think I had uh, Loriana. Um, on the extension to equity, that's something we can do. Um, thing is that uh, the European equity market um, is you know, quite a bit. Uh, smaller than the US. Um, and that would speak also to the European corporate bond market. So we're going to run into some, yeah, some, some illiquidity and some problem um, of, of sizes. But from a conceptual point of view, that's, that, would, that would be the case that investors sh should flow to other asset class, uh, classes as well. It just technically to show that we will run into a bit of uh, a bit of problems, but from a conceptual point of view, nothing present, uh, prevent those uh, those investors to uh, to go to those uh, to those assets. Loriana, maybe we can we can talk. Uh, yeah, afterwards, Marie, uh, I'll have to get back to you on this uh, magnitude. We um, I, I believe we have those and the papers, but uh, I get back uh, to you. And on uh, on the last um, question on the price. On the price impact, I feel okay. I feel that your question is about a, a second round effect where people would sell their asset because other people are selling the asset. That's um, it. May be that we're capturing something like that. Not sure we can tease out uh, this second round of effect. What? Okay. Thank you. Again. Yeah. Now, uh, let's move on to the second paper, Hunting for Dollars. And Angel, please, um, you have uh, 30 minutes to go. <clears throat> OK, thank you very much for uh, including this paper in this terrific program. Um, I think uh, it's a joint paper with uh, Peter Is, Clarks, and Edward Mati. Uh, Edward is on the job market at, at the moment and uh, is visiting Columbia University. 
and Petris is uh, working with me in Basel as a PhD candidate. So I think this paper is really relevant uh, to the focus of, of this conference on money markets because it bridges together two key money markets. The world self-funding market, especially the repo, which is the, the major market, uh, and then the FX swaps, right? In this paper, we connect these two markets together, right? And those markets are super important for domestic and global liquidity. Furthermore, this paper shed light on regulation impact the, the dollar funding, okay? So let me uh, uh, emphasize uh, the importance of the dollar further. I know that we are in the house of the euro and it's intimidating to see the euro logos watching me. But <laughs> as a matter of fact, the dollar uh, is the dominating currency. The dominate, it's dominating because almost 80% of the transaction are, are using the dollar, involving the dollar, and it's the dom it's dominating also for the financial intermediation, right? So the dollar is on demand from non-US, uh, especially from non-US institutions, right? So being the international reserve currencies, it's important that we understand if there is a, a real, reliable access to it. And it's also important to understand the pricing, right? Um, over the years, we have been seeing uh, volatility in the dollar cost and price, and uh, even uh, mispricing. Right, violation of the no arbitrage condition. Right, therefore, it's important to, to, for cost efficiency and price efficiency to understand better what's going on in the dollar funding market. Right, give, give, let me share with you some visual evidence about this mispricing. Ever since the global financial crisis, we have been seeing something like, like this. On the vertical axis, you have the, the, the Deviation from the covered interest rate parity, which Jean David um, and Amy explained very well before, right? And the horizontal axis is the time going on um, since the start of our data set to 2012, right? I think there are at least three interesting patterns here. The first is uh, that there is a systematic violation of the CIP basis. Uh, and that on average is about 30 basis point. The second pattern I would like to draw your attention on is that there are deterministic seasonal pattern that when we had, we lead to the quarter end, you have a spike in, in, the, in the basis. The third one is that if you look at the two lines, right, one is the time evolution of uh, the maturity of one week would be the, the CIP constructed with one tenor, one week tenor. That's the, that's the blue line. And the orange line instead is the one month maturity. So it's easy to see that the shorter maturity spikes much more when it enters the last week of the quarter, right? So in this paper, uh, building on a duetal, we are going to uh, refine an identification strategy uh, based on the maturity differences, OK? So in this context, in this context motivates our research question. The first one is that how non-US institutions, especially Eurozone banks, so I will back to the Eurozone importance in a moment, how non-US institutions secure dollar funding. Uh, we have a new data set, bespoken data set, that enable us to track at the high frequency every day, day by day, the flow of the dollar funding and the outstanding position. And the second question is uh, whether banking regulation indeed affect the dollar funding, um, and if this has some unintended consequences that will show up also in the pricing and even in the mispricing. So, for, of course, there is a large body in the literature looking at how regulation affect, affects market, 
But as Jean David pointed out before, the consensus is that the regulation tend to reduce or constrain the supply of FX swaps. Where in this paper, we, we turn it the, uh, the other way around. We are, I'm going to provide you evidence that is actually the demand that has uh, increased in the FX swap, right? And this demand increase is a reduction in the wholesale funding of provision of, of uh, US dollars, right? So we connect the wholesale funding market, so the US repo market. I'm going to show you that the main mechanism is that regulatory constraint, non-US institutions, banks, hunt for dollars in the FX swap market because they reduce their, their funding in the US repo market. Okay. So this repo swap substitution is driven by the regulatory framework and has both volume and price implication. So there is a volume shift, and we're going to quantify that. And, and then, since the new US institutions have an inelastic demand for FX swaps, this is going to create a premium at the quarter hand, which ref is reflected in the cross-currency basis. That's the story that we have in this paper and the new the novel mechanism. Okay. Yeah, so the literature has been pointing the finger on the supply side. We, we argue that is the demand side that is more important. And with our mechanism, we can solve three puzzles existing in the literature so far. The first one is that how could the CIP be affected uh, by the effect swaps uh, by a reduction of supply in the effect swap? If, after all, the, the swap position count only 1% from the for the leverage, leverage ratio regulation, right? So it doesn't penalize the leverage ratio. So why then, uh, say, say, US banks should reduce the supply of FX swaps? And it's, uh, the BIS peers were pretty vocal on this point. The second puzzle that we have is that uh, why do FX swap volume increase at the quarter end? Something that we provide evidence, right? If you think about the simple demand and supply framework, if it's a, a supply retreat, right, we shouldn't see an increase of volume. And instead, we do see that. For instance, if I can skip a moment in the appendix, right, this is what happens every end of quarter, right? So at zero, you have the end of quarter, and the, the line there is the uh, total volume of borrowing dollars at the quarter hand. And you see a spike of about 20, 200 billion in total of demand of dollar funding, right? So this cannot be reconciled with a uh, supply retreatment. And the third puzzle is that it's really a, 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 euro pro, a, a, a dollar problem. So if there are Eurozone banks that are constrained, they should curtail, they should reduce the supply of euros. And, and eventually it should be the euro that increase in, in appreciate. But it's only the dollar that appreciate. Okay, so with the mechanism that we have in mind, we can uh, answer these three questions. So first of all, let me, let me tell you a bit about the data. So the data, it's a bespoke a data set that I, I, I created in collaboration with the CLS. The CLS is the largest payment versus payment system in the world, right? It connect essentially national payment system like Target 2 in the Eurozone, Fedwire, 6 in Switzerland, um, uh, and so on. They connect, and when there is a cross-border payment, it's settled by uh, CLS. CLS has a very simple principle. You will be paid if you pay, right? It's not a clearinghouse, but it's a, it's a payment versus payment system. 
And it's amazing um, the, the volume they settle every day. When I visit them for the first time, there was a big screen, right? And every second was updated. And only on that day, they settled $7 trillion. It's amazing. And it's amazing also how the FX market has been stable during uh, several uh, financial crises, right? So this data set, we, we created um, a bespoke, um, a manually sorted uh, data set. Um, so we look at every bank, um, more than 4,000 banks, and they customer. So we have categories of market participant. And what is really important, we sorted them by nationality, but not the physical location of a, of a bank, of an institution, like sitting in, dollar, in, in London. London covers 80% of the transaction, if you look at just the physical location. But the nationality of the accounting basis they have. So for instance, a JP Morgan for us in London will be assigned as a US GCIP bank. Okay? So it's really important. And then we combine this uh, FX uh, data set with the wholesale funding data at the bank level for the European and the American wholesale money market. Okay. This enables us to map the network of the FX swap market. Right? So the network looks like this. I think there are three main takeaways. The first, look at the size of the dots. Right? The size of the dots tell you, how, on average, the, the outstanding quantity of this uh, group of market participants. And, and you see that the, and the color tells you, in green, if it's a net lender of dollars, if it's in red, if a net borrower of dollar. And finally, the arrows tells you the flow, where it's going. Okay? So there are three main takeaways, take I think, in this, in this case. First, the U.S. GIFs, as are the biggest, the major do dollar providers, of course, right? So you see them uh, in the size, and they are green. And on the other end, regardless of where they are, in which nation, custom bank customers are the net buyers, the net borrowers of dollars, right? See UK, Switzerland, Japan, and so on. And now the third consideration would say, look at the flows, right? But even the GC banks, non-US, are still net lenders of dollar. What's going on here is that they typically take dollars from the US GIPs and reallocate dollar funding to other, especially the, the, the customers, okay? So that's the, the network. Now we have a quantification of the network and the dynamics, now let's move to the key mechanisms that I want to put forward for you. Right? If you want to take away anything from this paper and presentation, I would like that you focus on, on these two figures now. Right? They summarize everything. So on the right hand side, you have the whole self funding market. Right? The red line is what the Eurozone banks uh, what, what they borrow in euro uh, uh, in the repo market. The gray line instead is what the very same Eurozone banks borrow in the US repo market. Okay. So it's striking to see that at the quarter end, there is a dramatic reduction on average of 50 billion of US dollar borrowing in the world self funding market. There is something also a seasonal effect in the Eurozone, but not that much. Okay, now let's move to the uh, figure on the right hand side. Now you have the very same Eurozone banks, and now this is what they do on average at a quarter end. The red dashed line uh, is the lending in dollars done by the Eurozone banks. And the dashed blue line instead is the borrowing of dollars via FX swaps, okay? So as you can see, this is the mirror image of the left-hand side uh, dynamic and suggests that there is a substitution effect, a substitution from the wholesale 
dollar funding into the FX swap dollar, uh, synthetic dollar funding. Okay. So this is the main mechanism. And now the question is why this happened, right, since years. So, and the idea is the following. So European uh, banks or non-US banks, that I will tell you more about that, but European banks substitute dollar funding uh, into synthetic dollar funding at quarter end because of regulation, right? There are, and we argue that there are two unintended consequences in the regulatory framework. The first one is the different treatment in terms of funding instrument, okay? So let me share with you a schematic view how you would account for these two instruments. Okay, so you have two options. Uh, you need $100. The first option that you have is to raise this funding in the repo market, right? So then you would account for that in the following manner. On the asset side, you would increase your cash that you borrowed, right? And you offset that with the repo debt, the repo loan. Notice that the collateral that you pledge in your repo contract, the bond, assuming that there is a zero haircut, the $100, right, has to remain your balance sheet. Why? Because the regulators design this rule as a temporary sale of asset just because it's a secured loan. The, the regulator is aware that this asset will return right away at the forward time, okay? So then it remains your balance sheet and the consequence is that the leverage ratio would uh, collapse down to, instead of one, to 0 0.67, okay? So that's the leverage ratio impact. Now, you can have a second way to raise your funding and in dollar, and you, you can use the option B, which is the swap. If you enter a swap, then the accounting consequence is gonna be, is gonna be off balance sheet, and you're gonna put your FX receivable on the asset side and the FX payable in the, in the liability side. Then your leverage ratio will uh, marginally be affected only by 1%, okay? So this is the first thing that you should keep in mind when you, talk, uh, when you think about regulation of funding. The second problem is when you need to report this data to the regulators or the central bank. In many countries, you just need to take a snapshot of your balance sheet items at the quarter end and deliver the data. In some other countries, in particular UK and US, is instead the daily average, right? You report as a US bank, for instance, average of the quarterly's daily values. So of course, in the former uh, snapshot system, there is some incentives to Windows dress. Okay. So now, let's be more rigorous and instead of just a figure, uh, try to nail down this effect with a more advanced uh, setting. So this is a difference in difference. Um, a regression where why I wanna capture the quantity effect at the moment, okay? The quantity effect is how much uh, I, uh, I'm gonna increase in terms of uh, swap volumes how much I'm gonna decrease in terms of repo volume and the share of them, okay. And then I have uh, an indicator, a dummy for, um, am I at the quarter end, heading at the quarter end or not? And am I a bank that should report the snapshot or not? Okay, so beta tree is our baby, right? We wanna see if this beta tree indeed captured this quantity effect at the quarter end. So the interaction between I am at the quarter end and I should report the snapshot, the picture of my balance sheet now, right? 
So a bit of visual evidence that we move to the uh, regression results. So the visual evidence is that on the left hand side you have the Eurozone banks, okay? And the vertical axis is how much they reduce in terms of uh, US dollar repo outstanding. And the vertical axis is how much they increase in terms of uh, FX swap outstanding to borrow dollars. And you see a clear negative relationship alluding to the substitution effect. If you do the very same exercise for UK GC banks, you don't see much. So this means that I'm going to take the Eurozone as a treated group and the UK bank as the control group. I run this difference in difference and this beta tree here, the interaction between the two factors, the two conditions, tells me that a Eurozone banks tend to increase by 13% more of what a UK bank does uh, in terms of FX swaps, reduce 35% more of uh, repos to borrow dollar, and the ratio in increases by 7.3%. Okay? So, of course, we have uh, run a number of exercises. Uh, all are uh, reinforcing our, our picture, right? For instance, the nationality. As I told you, it's not only Eurozone that use this snapshot system, but it's also Japan and, and Switzerland, right? So if you t uh, use uh, Swiss uh, banks and uh, Japanese bank as the treated group, and you also uh, substitute uh, US banks instead of UK banks as a control group, you have the very same picture, consistent. Currency is just the dollar. Year hand. Year hand is pretty interesting because at the year hand you have a full disclosure of your balance sheet as a GC bank. And indeed, is the mechanism is opposite. It's a secured uh, story. It's a secure money market. If you use unsecured funding, you don't find you don't find this. Uh, and, and finally, we also uh, use as a laboratory the uh, the reform of the U U.S. money market fund regulation, and indeed the effect has been stronger sin ever since. Okay, so let me move to the last part of the paper, which is, is there any pricing implication for this mechanism? Right? So by now you are very familiar with the CIP uh, equation. Jean-David used it before, and Ami as well. We also take the point of view of non-U.S agents. Take the Eurozone, for instance. The Eurozone bank has, or Eurozone actors have uh, two options, as I told you. Either rise dollar funding and the wholesale funding market, say a US repo, or um, do it on dom domestically and then swap in, into uh, dollars, right? So if you believe in my story, now we should uh, revise a bit uh, this uh, CIP equation by including the shadow costs coming from the regulation. The shadow costs would be here, the C, right, accounting for that. And eventually there could be also shadow regulatory cost on, on, the, uh, swap, uh, on the FX uh, instrument, right? So with a little bit of algebra, very simple algebra, you can show that the cross-currency basis, after all, is just the, the differential in terms of shadow cost between the, these two options. Okay. If the shadow cost in the wholesale funding is larger, this would create um, a CIP uh, deviation. So now visual evidence to support uh, the, the possible presence of a shadow cost. Again, on the, on the left hand side, you see Eurozone Bank the GCP, GCP's repo outstanding they have, and when they, like how these relate to the CIP basis. So you see a kind of relationship between them, and the figure on the right hand side suggests that this relationship is strengthened at the quarter end. Right. Jean David did a great job before explaining how the GIV works, right? So I'm not going to spend much time about that. We, we've, we, we um, carry out several specification of that, actually four, 
And let me just remind you there are two conditions that you need to fulfill to, to use the GIV. Is the um, relevance condition, which is um, you have large actors, right? And being, so, uh, being large, the shock they have is so severe to impact prices. That's the relevance condition. The, exclu the exclu exclusive condition instead says that being by very nature uh, uh, idiosyncratic shocks, right? Those are not driven, those shocks are not driven by macro general variables. Okay. So if the, those are satisfied, we can use the GIV. And what it, we, we found significant effects. So for an increase of 1% of uh, CIP basis, you have a reduction of demand uh, of uh, 41 basis point, suggesting that there is an inelastic demand of the dollar funding in the FX market. Now, we, with this, we provide evidence that there is a rigid demand for uh, FX swaps from non-US uh, institutions. And now we can even try to have some non-parametric evidence for, for, for this regulatory shadow cost. So we see a list, we, on top of the quantity data, we also create price, pricing uh, data. So I asked CLS to compute the volume weighted uh, swap points for every category and, uh, and nationality that we have in the data set. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then what you can do is to see how much cost, effect, the effective cost in terms of CIP basis for those categories in the data set. Okay. So you see within the quarter, during the quarter, you typically they pay um, a hypothetical uh, effective cost in CIP basis of about 20, 30%, which is more or less the secular average that you have seen before. When they enter in the quarter hand, and you take now this instrument that remain in the balance sheet, this uh, uh, basis point deviation is, it goes up uh, twice, essentially. Is there any, in the cross-section, any difference? Well, not much, but uh, Japan. I think Japan is the one that, uh, for them, it's more costly, the, the synthetic dollar funding. And this is natural because Japan is typically uh, edging the position uh, with a large, with a large uh, outstanding position, okay? Now, if you combine now these uh, uh, CLS prices with the outstanding position and how they change, you can even estimate um, what is the CIP uh, losses or, uh, or income that they would do, right? And here, let me draw your attention to only two, two main takeaways, uh, at least in my view. The first one is that if you look at when they enter at the quarter end in column five and six, how much they borrow more or lend more in dollar, and they implied CIP uh, income or losses, you will see that after all, these numbers are uh, offsetting each other, suggesting to me that banks, GC banks, are um, intermediating a lot for the customers, and they do that offsetting essentially position. There is not much of net position remaining, okay? So this suggests to me that indeed there is a market making intermediation activity, and they are pretty um, efficient in uh, optimizing the this position and reducing the, the losses in terms of CIP basis. Mm -hmm. Who is really uh, gaining uh, in this game is, uh, are the US GC banks, right? And who is losing in terms of CIP basis is more the, the bank customers. So let me conclude. Um, this paper. Uh, we argue that there is a distortion FX swap market uh, driven by regulation uh, that penalizes essentially non-US banks in the wholesale US dollar funding. 
Um, the important friction are, are the following. There is an inelastic demand of US dollar funding, and the cost is based on, on customers, apparently. Of course, there are several policy implications. I think you are in a better position than me. Uh, you know much better than me how the policy is implemented and, and designed. But to me, I think what I, I take from this paper is that uh, the regulators should have an aggregate view uh, of the uh, financial system and also try to see them in an holistic way. So when you, uh, for instance, regulate the wholesale funding market, you should also think, take into account what are the effect on, say, in the currency market. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, thank you, Angelo, for the, the very you know, well-structured presentation. And now, uh, Anusha, yeah, your turn. You have 10 minutes. <coughs> Uh, thanks so much to the organizers for inviting me to discuss this paper. And I have to say, this was a really tough paper to discuss because um, it's so well done, really brilliantly executed, a very clever setting, identification strategy, new results, etc. So um, let me take a shot at um, describing what this paper does, and some um, I'll focus at the end at some um, on some policy implications. So um, what the paper does is provides very novel empirical evidence, um, as Angelo said, from the demand side rather than the supply side on um, CIP deviations. And it does so by looking at um, the heterogeneity in uh, regulations um, across different types of banks um, in different jurisdictions. And here we really are focusing on how regulation matters for financial intermediaries and institutions through the balance sheet channel. Um, moreover, um, it really emphasizes how special the dollar is um, and how intermediaries and um, institutions have inelastic demand for US dollars. So we, we know Amy's discussion focused on this elasticity question a great deal, but I think this paper really makes stride in showing how this order flow for US dollars is, is pretty inelastic and they're able to quantify it. So I think that's a very nice, um, nice sort of finding in this paper. Uh, the main exercise, of course, is, is sort of similar to this quarter end window dressing that um, Do It All have shown. But I think this paper is really uh, makes strides in showing us a, a very novel mechanism, uh, which is different from the supply side focus that has been there in the, in the literature. So the Do It All paper show these, uh, these large CIP deviations emerge at quarter ends. And uh, what Angela's paper does is that it looks at these spikes, it really looks at these spikes in detail um, of in, in FX swap volumes at uh, quarter ends. Um, and what it finds is, the paper finds is that these non-US banks satisfy their inelastic dollar demand through FX swaps given regulatory constraints. So um, compared to the earlier paper, um, this really shows that the demand for, um, for, for, for dollars goes up and the demand for FX swaps goes up rather than going down when the CIP uh, deviation emerges. So I think that's, that's another very interesting um, result in this paper. So what is the motivation? Very briefly, what we see is that Basel III has this risk unweighted capital adequacy uh, regulation on the lever leverage ratio, which imposes constraints and opportunity costs. We'll talk a little bit more about these opportunity costs on both the balance sheet size and space um, for, 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 for banks. Um, and what the paper focuses on is the fact that there are two ways in which non-US banks can access dollar funding. The first is through the wholesale repo market, which is on the balance sheet and regulated, but inexpensive. Um, and so uh, the wholesale, uh, you know, it, Angelo talked about the shadow cost, but really the way to think about this is that what is the shadow cost over and above 
uh, the interest rates, and that's coming through two things. One is the regulatory constraints imposed by this leverage ratio, and the second is the need to source collateral. Um, and so that is what, what drives these wholesale repo uh, funding costs. And then we have the synthetic uh, FX swap, which we think as being more expensive um, in normal times, but this is off balance sheet, so there's this differential uh, regulation, which is just 1% that Angelo talked about. So the regulatory pressures are not the same as what you have through the wholesale repo funding, uh, but, but you know, this is relatively more expensive um, when we measure it based on this CIP basis, cross-currency basis. So at the quarter end, the regulator shows up. What do banks do? Classic regulatory arbitrage story here. Uh, because of the regulation that we have in, 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 in for Eurozone banks, we have this window dressing um, and banks switch from wholesale to synthetic, um, albeit more expensive, so long as the cross-currency basis is less than that shadow cost of wholesale, um, wholesale borrowing. So, um, you know, why, why, why is all of this happening? I think that the really interesting feature is that they are able to show that the um, intermediary constraints in the wholesale market actually have substitution effects and spillover effects in the FX swap market. Um, and why is that? Um, that at quarter end, given that we know that these intermediary constraints exist in the wholesale market, um, the, when order flow shows up in the FX swap market, we know that this is inelastic demand and the currency, uh, cross-currency basis opens up. So, it's, um, so it's, a, it's a very interesting story in terms of how the intermediary constraints and the frictions in the wholesale market have spillover effects in the um, FX, FX swap market. And again, uh, to emphasize, this is coming through demand and not through supply. Um, so the data is a bespoke CLS data set with quantities, prices, and counterparties. Um, they classify these counterparties into GSIBs, both US and non-US. Uh, regular banks and non-banks, as well as the, 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 the customers. They have a nationality classification that Angelo talked about and captures at least 30% uh, of the FX market, uh, according to BIS. Hyun Shin had a very nice uh, sort of thread on Twitter, if you want to sort of take a look at it, um, outlining this, this very nice CLS uh, data set. So what do the data tell us? Um, that the lending behavior in the FX market, and Angelo presented this very nice um, visualization, which is that the market is dominated by GSIBs, big banks really. The GSIBs are lenders, the US GSIBs are the largest, um, and, uh, and then uh, the US GSIBs and non US GSIBs lend to their end customers, and the customers are the net borrowers, and so I really like that network. Um, visualization, and, and Angelo also showed us that on the FX swaps trading volume that this swaps at quarter end. So this is really the main result of this paper, which shows the substitution from the repo market to the FX swap market. The dashed lines on the left-hand side basically show us that the um, demand for wholesale funding um, drops at quarter end. So it's very striking how you see these drops in quarter end, uh, whereas the euro borrowing in the, uh, in the, in, in the repo markets, um, you know, there's some variation, but not very much. And that's you know, reflected on the right-hand side where we see this demand for FX swaps um, going up. And one sort of small visualization suggestion that I have for you, Angelo, is that why not do the left-hand side figure also in event time? You showed us you know, um, in your presentation, but I think that would be very striking because we would see uh, the demand collapse in event time in the repo market, and that would really show us that mirror image in the FX 
uh, swap market. So the identification is via heterogeneous regulations to establish the substitution across dollar funding sources. Um, and uh, the regulatory incentive is really this, this difference between the average daily balances that have to be reported by US and UK banks, uh, whereas Eurozone and other uh, banks around the world are using these quarter end ratios or this snapshot as, as Angelo called it. Um, and so they use the UK banks as a in the control group because there isn't this imperative to uh, window dress um, at the quarter end. Um, and so the, uh, you know, um, we, we sort of see this, uh, the, the, the findings that um, Angelo showed us about FX swap demand going up at the, at the end of the quarter. So, you know, where I thought this was going was that we would find that these distortive effects um, in the FX swap market would suggest that we should, you know, why not adopt average daily balances? But when, when you look at you know, the net losses from uh, the um, FX swap, it's only 37 million. Um, if you switch into these FX swaps for a few days and show your very pretty snapshot to the regulator, um, and, um, and instead, if you were to hold that equity capital on you know, throughout, the, throughout the quarter, um, Angelo has a very nice back of the envelope calculation which shows that this would be 150 million. So there's a 74% cost reduction by doing this regulatory arbitrage. Um, and so, you know, really we want to think about what are the financial stability implications of this because from the bank's perspective, this regulatory arbitrage is, is efficient. But what are the welfare implications of this substitution of these pricing distortions? Um, and then what's really going on intra-quarter? Um, because we see this 50 billion moving into the FX swap market. So I, I hope that we can discuss this a little bit more. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Anusha. And uh, let me take a couple of questions from the Laws. Thank you very much. Um, yes, please. You may. So first of all, fascinating uh, panel, all of you. Um, and um, Angelo, of course, I mean, uh, the work you did on the data, on the CLS data, is, is really impressive, I think, uh, for all of us, including in the central banking community. Um, so I'm going to have two questions. Perhaps also on behalf of you know my other central bank colleagues and and Kenji, please don't hesitate to add you know to my question. Uh, first question is simple: is on your um, what you observed in your data uh, among the non-US banks, okay? And you had Euro area, you had Japanese, you had Swiss, you had UK. What what are the main differences, if any, you see and behavior, you know, in accessing repo and in accessing FX swaps. I mean, you mentioned the cost for uh, Japanese banks are quarter rent, uh, but there may be others. And the second question is more about, you know, kind of implications for us as uh, central bankers, market practitioners. Um, so you show that um, actually non-US banks don't, uh, I'm going to oversimplify, don't need the FX swap market, um, you know, uh, so much at quarter end, yeah? But they need it at year end <laughs> because of your GCIP score um, thing, yeah? Uh, so, so are there any applications for us uh, as central bankers of, of doing that? And you know that, that we have instruments and so on. And the second question is, you know, as you showed, um, this has been going on. I mean, this violation of the CIP parity and all these losses and gains uh, have been going on for uh, more than 10 years. So everybody knows about that by now. Now they will know even more with your paper. But uh, why is that never arbitraged away by you know actors that don't have the same regulatory constraints and are able to act also in these markets? Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, let me have two. Or, yeah, two more questions. Yeah, over there. This one and this one. <coughs> yep. 
Thanks, Angelo, for the paper. Very, very interesting. I have a very quick question. In your uh, charts, uh, you show only the net borrowing in US dollar and euro by uh, non-US uh, banks. Uh, why only uh, you don't show the net position, so borrowing versus lending? Or have you tried if, uh, if this uh, could provide different, uh, different indication of what happened quarter end? Thank you. Last question, please. Thank you. <coughs> Morris Lennon, Princeton. So combining a bit the two papers that we saw, I, I take CIP deviations can occur because there can be supply shocks in the wholesale funding market. It's kind of your story. Then I, the first paper sounds a bit more like uh, there's supply shocks in, this, in, the, in the CIP market. And then, of course, there could also be changes in demand because the demand for dollar asset holdings in Europe is changing, and that changes demand. I guess quantities should probably disentangle those. And so I guess away from quarter ends, do you also see... CIP deviations co-move with more or less swap positions or not, I guess, is like a, would probably help, help us think about the, use, just the supply story away from quarter ends. Does that make sense? Thank you. So, uh, Andrew, yeah, yes. you address the, uh, the questions you. and discussion? Yeah. Yes, thank you. So, first of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Anusha, for your uh, fantastic discussion. And um, I think it's a brilliant idea that we also cre uh, plot the same time evolution of uh, instead of just collapsing on the average pattern. What we wanted to do is indeed also to answer Giuseppe um, and also to disentangle indeed the, we, we do show the net, but we also study the, the, the borrowing and the lending uh, and not the net. And, and that was the idea indeed to show these two different patterns, this entangle. Also because uh, there was a, a, a very nice paper before us uh, by Jonathan Wallen. And Jonathan Wallen studied um, uh, this topic, but he looked just at the net position. And if you look at the net position, then you wouldn't see uh, indeed that the US, US, US Eurozone banks actually are, are continue to, to, to lend dollars as, as, as usual, but just increase the demand uh, in, in, in dollar funding. So I think it's really important to look at them also separately. Um, Iman, very good points. Um, uh, I would say on top of my head, two different, two different uh, patterns distinguish the non-US uh, banks. The first is Japan, as whose, uh, whose banks are very concentrated in the, in the dollar yen positions. Instead, the Eurozone banks are much, well, yes, are much more uh, active in the whole G7. Um, and we do see that in the data. And this enables the US uh, um, Eurozone banks to be also better in optimizing the, 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 the minimization of the losses in terms of CIP basis at the quarter end um, because they can uh, diversify better the portfolio, indeed. Um, why this is not arbitraged out? Because it's a regulatory cost, it's reflected in the CIP basis, and you're not, you're not gonna get rid of it because there is an elastic demand. Now, the next question is why there is no new uh, actors like um, hedge fund and so on. I believe that this, at least the, the uh, swap market, in, in general, the derivative currency market is very a it's a traditional market dominated by dealer, dealer banks. And it's not easy to enter in this market because it's a peer-to-peer -peer over the counter market. Uh, it's pretty segmented. It seems to, it's the largest market in the world, but it's pretty segmented and the relationships are still matter. The spot FX market instead um, has been seeing more electronification, more new entrant uh, in the EBS platform, in the Refinitiv Re Reuters platform, um, but not the derivative one. So it, it could be, uh, could be that it will change in the future, but at the moment it's still dominated by traditional dealers. Uh, let me one additional yeah, question. <clears throat> Hi, thank you. I'm Gene Frieder from the London School of Economics. Um, 
Uh, having worked for a very large real money fixed income manager in the past, um, you know, my observation is that uh, there is actually quite a bit of sophistication and involvement from other potential suppliers of dollars in the market. And there was an active, you know, there's an ongoing and active effort to lean against those spikes. I mean, uh, I, th I think your paper was great, but it does feel very partial equilibrium. And when you look at what both reserve managers and some of these very large real money managers, as well as money funds can do, I think it still sort of leaves a mystery um, as to why these spikes happen when it's such a well-identified pattern, sorry. Um, so I don't have a good answer, but just to say that, you know, 50 billion doesn't sound like a lot when you look at the size of some of these real money balance sheets and the way that they lean against at quarter end. Yeah, I, I think uh, it's a matter of quantity. Um, in total, it's 200 billion in one day. Um, doesn't seem to me peanuts. Uh, and on top of that, it seems that this market is inelastic. So this creates a price impact. I do believe that there are um, market participants that try to profit from these arbitrage opportunities, I'm sure, but eventually it's not enough to close the gap. That's, that's the point that uh, we want to make here. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for fascinating discussion. And uh, if I may, uh, you know, the difference or you know, thirsty of Japanese banks, Japanese financial institutions toward uh, data or foreign asset, you know, partly must come from the very low interest rate environment in Japan. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, of course, you know, we, we are adjusting gradually, but uh, yeah, definitely it plays a role. And uh, yeah. So anyway, yeah. Thank you very much for the fascinating discussion and the paper presented us. And uh, yeah. Uh, again, the big fans and. Uh,